Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 27, Brunei. So today's drink of choice is Te Tariq, or pulled tea. Pulled tea is a kind of tea that is popular in the Malay world, and it's made by adding condensed milk to black tea, and then pulling the milk by pouring the drink between two separate containers a couple times. The tea apparently became very popular in Malaysia during World War II, and has since become the national drink of Malaysia, and has spread to other parts of the region, like Brunei. It's honestly pretty fun to make, but in terms of the tea itself, I don't really think it's that special. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but as I have stated in several other episodes, I like tea with no milk or sugar, so I probably wouldn't go out of my way to make it again. The nation of Brunei, the abode of peace, yes, that is the official name of the country, is located in Southeast Asia. It is located on the island of Borneo and is surrounded by the Malaysian state of Sarawak and the South China Sea. It is, interestingly enough, divided into two sections. First, the western section of the country, which is where the majority of the population is, and then the exclave of Tembrong in the east. Tembrong is the most forested part of the country, but the western section also has many tropical forests. The more inland you go, the higher it gets, with some mountains in Tembrong. Brunei has a little less than half a million people in it. Ethnically, it is mostly Malay, which explains why Te Tariq is popular there. Around 60% are Malay. There are also various indigenous tribal people groups in the country, who make up roughly 10%. Some of the largest seem to be the Keduyan, the Iban, the Balait, and the Dusun. The remaining 30% are composed of several different groups, who have immigrated into the country in the past 150 years. These include the Chinese and the Indians, two groups I mentioned being quite common in Malaysia in my Malaysian Political Parties episode. But there also are large numbers of Europeans, Australians, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and American expats who have settled in the country. Language-wise, most people will speak Malay, and Bruneian Malay apparently has a very strong accent to it. English and Arabic are also commonly understood in the country. English is often used in business and education, while Arabic is used in religious ceremonies and in private education. Chinese, Tamil, and various tribal languages of Borneo are also spoken by their respective ethnic groups. Finally, religion-wise, Brunei is mostly Muslim. Sunni Islam is the official religion, and around 80% of the country are Muslim. All Malays are officially Muslim, and a decent number of expats and tribal people also are Muslim. Other religious groups are present in the country. 7% are Christian, and another 7% are Buddhist. Christians are divided roughly in half by Protestants and Catholics, and most Christians are either expats or tribal people. Buddhists, on the other hand, tend to be mostly Chinese. Smaller folk religions, Hinduism and Sikhism, are also present. Brunei has since its early history been involved in trade in some way. Much of northern Borneo was dominated by various trading sites in the ancient and medieval period. These sites traded with both each other, merchants from the neighboring Philippines and Southeast Asia, and even as far away as India. We know starting with the Song Dynasty, Chinese merchants and goods found their way into the region, and began making an impact. Islam would be brought over by merchants, although they at first failed to convert the entire population, as Hinduism and Buddhist beliefs reigned supreme. Hinduism would be strengthened in Brunei, with its rule under the Majapahit Empire. This empire is believed to have given some limited autonomy to Brunei, but ultimately controlled the state, with Brunei paying a tribute to the empire. Most of the 13th century would see Brunei under the Majapahit Empire. By the end of the century, however, Majapahit rule was waning, and Brunei emerged as an independent sultanate. This sultanate quickly began to expand, as the fall of the Majapahit had led to a power vacuum across maritime Southeast Asia. Brunei quickly managed to take much of the northwestern coast of Borneo Island, and even expanded to take, or at least hold influence over, several islands in the Philippines and Indonesia. Islam would rise to a prominent place in Brunei, as more people began to convert. This would be consolidated under the Sultan Sharif Ali, who was actually from Saudi Arabia and a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Brunei would ultimately reach its height from 1485 to 1524, under Sultan Bolkiah, who managed to expand Brunei to its territorial height and make Islamic law present throughout its domain. By the 1500s, European traders began to arrive in the region, while most people focus on 16th century colonialism in the context of the Americas, 
Southeast Asia was experiencing Europeans establishing colonies as well. The Portuguese and the Spanish in particular eyed rich Brunei and coveted its wealth. Also, as just a fun fact, apparently one Italian scholar had a 54-course meal when he visited the country, which makes me question just how big these meals were or how hungry the Italian was. In the Philippines, the Spanish began taking land, hoping to expand its control of the lucrative spice market. The Spanish were also driven by a strong desire to oppose Islam wherever they found it. As they betrayed themselves as a champion of Western Christendom, the Spanish began allying with the local Filipinos hostile to Muslim rule and slowly began taking smaller Muslim states in the region. In 1578, a strange force of Spaniards, Filipinos, pro-Spanish Bruneians, and even Mexicans from colonial Mexico invaded Brunei and engaged a force of Bruneians, along with support from Ottoman auxiliaries, who wanted to halt Spain's growing power. The Spanish-led force eventually took Brunei and sacked the capital. While the Spanish initially wanted to annex the country, disease swept through the Spanish force, forcing the Spanish to flee. While Brunei emerged still as an independent state, they were severely weakened. Brunei lost most of its influence in the Philippines and were largely restricted to Borneo. They would be weakened even further when civil war broke out in the 17th century. The son of a sultan killed the son of a very high-ranking noble over a cockfight in 1660. While the high-ranking noble should have realized his son was being too cocky, he instead declared himself sultan after the current sultan refused to punish his son. This high-ranking noble was then overthrown in 1673 by another high-ranking official with the aid of the Sultan of Sulu. Admittedly, this wasn't an incredibly important turning point, and I mostly recount it to make a pun, but it did importantly result in land in what is now Sabah to be taken over by the Sultan of Sulu for his services in the war, and led to even more weaknesses in the Sultanate of Brunei. By the 19th century, other Europeans had begun to make inroads in Southeast Asia, including the British. The British, wanting to ensure that trade in the region couldn't be threatened, began taking what is now Malaysia and Singapore, and looked to expand on the island of Borneo. The British, under explorer James Brooke, helped Brunei defeat a rebellion, and Brunei gave land in the south to Brooke. Brooke established the kingdom of Sarawak, and with aid from the British, began holding more land on the island of Borneo. Brunei quickly ceded more land and power to Sarawak, which meant they were pretty much ceding more power to the British. In 1888, the Sultan of Brunei, fearing that Brooke Sarawak would eventually absorb all of Brunei, asked for the British to turn Brunei into a British protectorate. This the British did, and Brunei was brought into the British Empire. Brunei would experience great change under British rule. Brunei would see it divided in two, as in 1890, the British gave away land connecting Tamburong from the rest of Brunei. The Sultan still held ceremonial power, but British administrators held most of the actual political power. While Brunei, for centuries, had a small population of Indian and Chinese merchants, and possibly their families, this Chinese and Indian population expanded under British rule. As foreign merchants set up shop in the country, or were brought into work on the new major industry of Brunei, oil. Oil was discovered in 1929, and this made Brunei an important oil exporter. And since the discovery of this, Brunei's economy has largely been based entirely on oil. The capital of Brunei, Bandar Siri Bhagawan, would also expand during this time. This role as an important oil producer made the country a target in World War II. As Japan expanded across Southeast Asia after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, it took all of Borneo, including Brunei, in late 1941. Brunei quickly fell, and the oil was now used to feed Japan's war effort. The Japanese encouraged the use of Japanese, and arrested and detained all British colonial officials in the territory. The Sultan himself mostly kept a low profile and was a figurehead, refusing to outright support the Japanese, although he didn't attempt to organize any resistance to them. By 1945, Australian troops had retaken Brunei, and Brunei found itself again under British rule. However, the post-World War II years saw decolonization movements spring up throughout the world, and Brunei hoped to become free. The Sultan began to push hard for greater powers for himself, and backed efforts by Malay nationalists in British Southeast Asia to establish a new country. He and his allies believed that Brunei was too small to exist on its own, and needed Malaysia to protect them, and that Brunei's oil interests could be expanded in a single Malaysian state. As British Malaysia was granted more autonomy, the Sultan of Brunei watched on happily. However, not all supported such a union. 
countries like Indonesia opposed the United States that could oppose them in the region and began backing the Small Brunei People's Party, or PRB. The PRB was a leftist party and believed that if northern Borneo united with Peninsular Malaysia, then Peninsular Malaysia would dominate them and they would become a colony of this new state. The PRB began agitating against the merger of Brunei with the rest of British colonies in Southeast Asia and fought for greater democratic power for the people. They sought to form either an independent state of North Borneo with Sarawak and Sabah, or for all of North Borneo to be united under a single powerful entity within Malaysia that they felt could counteract Peninsular Malaysia's large population. When Brunei held elections in 1962, the PRB won every single seat up for election. However, the Sultan delayed the start of the legislative period, meaning that while the PRB won the election, they couldn't actually take up their role and influence the country. In December, the PRB went into revolt and attempted to take the capital. However, the PRB was largely made up of untrained volunteers, and the British, not wanting a left-wing state to spring up in the region, sent troops to put down the revolt. The revolt, while it failed, did result in Brunei reconsidering in joining Malaysia. After negotiations the following year resulted in unfavorable terms being presented to the Sultan, Brunei decided to not join Malaysia when it became independent. However, Brunei still sought independence for itself. The Sultan continued to push for increased autonomy for his kingdom. The British largely agreed to this. And starting in 1959, more and more power was handed over to the Sultan. At New Year's Eve 1983, the country of Brunei declared independence and became an independent state at midnight. It is still in the Commonwealth and maintains good ties with Britain. Britain has a military base in the country, and many British businesses operate in it. But Brunei is now fully independent. Brunei so far has actually only had one leader since independence. The current sultan, Hassan al bolkia has run Brunei since 1967, and rules as an absolute monarch. He has unchecked power, and can constitutionally do pretty much whatever he wants. He, his family, and loyalists to his family control all the high-ranking government jobs. Bolkia himself serves as the country's Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, Minister of Finance, and Minister of Foreign Affairs. It probably isn't surprising to hear that this absolute monarchy doesn't really have a lot of democracy present in it. No elections take place, no political parties exist legally, and criticizing the government can result in censorship, fines, or imprisonment. The country is also under a policy known as Malayu Islam Brejia, which essentially makes it so Malay Muslims are the dominant political force in the country. Only Muslim Malays can be appointed into any political position, and the army is entirely made up of ethnic Malays. Other religious groups may practice their faith, but have to have permission to convert out of Islam and can't show any signs of their faith in public. LGBTQ individuals can be killed if they are outed, special sexual assault isn't criminalized, and there are claims of corruption and sex trafficking by the Sultan and or his family. While this is all certainly bad, and the image of an evil, cruel Sultan is often betrayed by Western journalists, you can still find many people loving the Sultan and not actively opposing the government. Part of this you could explain by state propaganda, but one of the biggest factors in why many people like the Sultan is due to Brunei's relatively prosperous economy. Oil continues to bring in a massive amount of wealth into the country. This revenue is then used to give citizens of the country very cheap healthcare, free education, and low gas prices. While there is some poverty and unemployment, many jobs in the country pay relatively well, with the country having a higher average salary than most of its immediate neighbors, has a high GDP per capita, and a high HDI index. The country is pretty stable, with low crime and no major terrorist groups operating in the country, except for the Shell Company, of course. While the Sultan gets a lot of bad press internationally, there's still a lot of love for him in the country. Since independence, things have changed quite a bit for the country. Oil money, besides going to help the people of the country, and more cynically, to finance the Sultan and his family's wealthy lifestyle, has also gone towards building up the country's infrastructure and modernizing it. Foreign investment and influence is quite prominent, with many foreign businesses and expats present in the country. The economy has expanded slightly towards banking and tourism, but oil is still king in the country. Sharia law was also implemented in the country in 2014. 
In terms of organized opposition to the Sultan, there really doesn't seem to be any. There is almost certainly some small Maoist organization in the country, because, well, every country in Asia has at least one Maoist group plotting to overthrow the government. But more seriously, liberal and Islamist groups could emerge in the country if the Sultan becomes unpopular for whatever reason. The biggest concern for the government is probably what the future entails in a world where renewable energy becomes more relevant and oil stops being a moneymaker, and or when Brunei's oil reserves dry up. It seems this won't happen for another 10 or so years, but it is a concern for the government to start moving the economy away from just oil. So why does Brunei exist? Brunei is like a lot of small countries in the world, an interesting quirk. It was once a powerful empire ruling parts of Southeast Asia, and today has become a powerful economic player in the region. The country has, for over 600 years, been under the rule of a sultan in one form or another. While there will almost certainly be a day when there is no more sultans of Brunei, that day seems to be something in the far-off future, and for now, Brunei will continue to be synonymous with the sultanate. Next, we'll go to Eastern Europe and go to Bulgaria. Prepare for empires, czars, communism, and a lot of brutal infighting. Thanks for listening, and take care. So after this, um, I'll do Italian political parties, and then after that I'll talk about the Chinese United Front, and then I will get to the history of Bulgaria. I'm not sure how long it'll take for all those. I know uh, college is picking up for me a little bit, but I feel like every other episode just switches between me going, oh yeah, it's slowing down, and then me going, oh no, it's speeding back up, so who knows. Maybe it doesn't even affect the, the rate of the podcast at all, and I'm all just making it up in my head, but who knows. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, take care. If you want, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. So the sources I use for this episode are Brunei Times article, Civil War Wrecks Chaos in the Country, Freedom House's report on Brunei, Geography Now's video on Brunei, History Hustle's video on the Kingdom of Sarawak, Jasby's video, The Strangest War in History, Aztecs vs. Ottomans, Mr. History's video on the history of Brunei, Periscope's film video, The Abode of Peace Brunei Documentary, Real Royalty's video, The Lavish Life of the Sinister Sultan of Brunei, SOAS University of London's page on its Brunei Gallery, The Free Library's essay on the Little Sultan, Wacker World's interview with the Sultan of Brunei, and Wikipedia.